Hello and welcome to the I Think Biology and PTEL course. In this week, we are talking about the building blocks of biology. This lecture is on biomolecules. In the first part of this lecture, I spoke about nucleic acids and proteins. In the second part of this lecture, I will be talking about polysaccharides and lipids. Polysaccharides are made up of simpler molecules such as sugars or monosaccharides. And here we can look at the structure of glucose, which is the main sugar which is used in making polysaccharides. Glucose can exist in the straight chain form or in the ring form. And the ring form are of two types. You can have alpha or beta glucose. And they differ from each other based on the position of the OH group, which is attached to the carbon at the first position in the ring, uh, which is shown here in blue. In alpha glucose, the OH group is below the plane of the ring and in beta glucose, it is above the plane of the ring. And this matters because the kinds of structures you can make using alpha glucose or beta glucose are very different. And the two main structures you will make are starch or cellulose. Starch is a polymer of alpha glucose monomers and they can have two kinds of linkages. They can either form the 1,4 glycosidic bond which is basically two glucose molecules coming together in a dehydration reaction, which I spoke of earlier. And this will give you a linear polymer or a linear chain. You can also have a 1,6 glycosidic bond. So this will lead to branching in the polymer such that you will have a more open structure. Cellulose is made up of beta glucose monomers linking in in the 1,4 glycosidic bond to get give a linear polymer. The difference being that if you look at the OH group which has been highlighted in yellow in starch, the OH group on the second carbon is all on the same side of the plane of the plane of the uh, molecule, whereas in cellulose it is flipped in every alternate uh, glucose monomer is flipped such that the OH group is on, is on opposite sides of the plane of the molecule. And this allows cellulose to make higher order structures because each cellulose molecule can hydrogen bond with another uh, such cellulose molecule uh, in order to get many fibers or many linear polymers coming together to form one fiber of cellulose. So this also has other implications. The structure can impact the properties of the molecule. And we can think about this question as to why can we digest starch but not cellulose and look at it from a structural standpoint. This is a schematic of uh, the structures you will find in the main polysaccharides found in plants and animals. So starch, uh, is made up of two polysaccharides, amylose, which is a linear uh, polymer formed by the linking of 1,4 glycosidic alpha glucose bonds. Amylopectin has both 1,4 and 1,6 bonds, so it is a branched structure. And so starch is a mixture of amylose and amylopectin. Glycogen, which is a polysaccharide found in animal cells used for storage of glucose, has a similar branched structure. But it has a more uh, it has more branches as compared to starch, and the reason is thought to be is in animal cells uh, we do not store a lot of polysaccharides. We only have small stores of glycogen, and we need to make fairly rapid use of this store upon demand. So if you have a more open structure, the hydrolysis of uh, glycogen in order to generate glucose monomers will be faster as compared to starch. And that's the reason why it will have more branches and more of an open structure. Cellulose, as I already said, can form fibers, which are basically hydrogen bonded cellulose molecules. And then these fibers also come together to form larger structures called microfibrils. And then these microfibrils can form a mesh, which will give very interesting properties to wood such that it has strength but also some elasticity. 
and this is what makes wood such a versatile material is the is the hierarchical structural build up of cellulose there are also other polysaccharides which form part of the superstructure of wood but we are not going to go into that another class of uh, polysaccharides are called glycosaminoglycans and here you can see that if you look at the repeating structure of the gag it has a charged group in the form of nho and what this does is that it allows these polysaccharides to bind a lot of water molecules such that these interactions give them a very slimy feel and so these uh, gags are found in mucus or snot and they're also find, found in synovial fluid where they are used for the lubrication of joints because they can entrap a very large quantity of water some well known gags are keratin sulfate heparin hyaluronic acid and chondroitin sulfate and in fact some of these are sold as supplements and people with arthritis are urged to take either chondroitin sulfate or keratin sulfate in the hopes that it will build up these tissues where the joints are facing a lot of inflammation and degradation shown here is another kind of polysaccharide and this is a composite molecule uh, the image here has been produced using a technique called atomic force microscopy but i won't go into the details of that but it allows us to visualize molecules at the atomic or even the molecular uh, scale and look at their structure the physical structure and aggregan which is the molecule which is shown here is made up of a protein and polysaccharides so it has a protein core and you can see that it's been marked here uh, with the n n being shown and the c n being shown and then hanging off that protein core are many polysaccharides and there are so uh, numerous that it gives a bottle brush appearance to this molecule and the kinds of polysaccharides you can have can also be different you can have keratin sulfate you can have chondroitin sulfate so and their numbers can also differ so you can have a diversity in the kinds of polysaccharides which are attached to this protein core so again this molecule aggregan is found in our joints in cartilage uh, and it is used for cushioning and uh, there is much work going on in studying the different states in which aggregan is found for instance in this particular study they looked at aggregan in fetal tissues and mature tissues uh, to find out what are the differences it undergoes during development people are also looking at disease states such as arthritis and normal states to find out what are the changes happening to aggregan uh, in such conditions so much interesting work is also happening on polysaccharides then let's move on to lipids lipids come in three main classes of molecules you have fatty acids you have triglycerides and you have sterols fatty acids are long chain hydrocarbons and you can which end with a carboxylic group and uh, the number of carbons in the chain can vary which can lead to a diversity of molecules you can also have saturated fatty acids and unsaturated fatty acids and there also you can have uh, varying degrees of unsaturation so you can have uh, molecules with one double bond or three double bonds to six double bonds and this can change the properties of the molecule then you can have a triglyceride which is basically a glycerol molecule to which you can attach fatty acids using an ester bond so again depending on the kinds of fatty acids which are attached uh, to the glycerol backbone you can produ produce a variety of molecules at the bottom of the slide i have shown a variation which we all know about uh, which is a phospholipid so phospholipid is also built on a glycerol backbone and it has two fatty acids hanging off the glycerol molecule and then one part of the molecule will have the phosphatidylcholine head which will make one particular kind of phospholipid which we are all familiar with finally we also have sterols which are considered as lipids and they are ring structures and the most famous one that we are all aware of are is cholesterol which forms an integral part of our membranes and is also uh, the building block for all our hormones 
shown here uh, is some more detail on these lipid structures. So you have starting from the left, a glycerol phospholipid, which I've already explained. Then you can also have glycerol lipids. So instead of having a phosphate head, it will just have an OH group hanging off the glycerol backbone. You can have sphingolipids, which have a NH in the starting. You can have fatty acids. I won't talk about polyketides or prenol lipids. And you can have sterols. The other uh, lipid which is shown here is a saccharolipid. Uh, and I decided to show it because what I had mentioned earlier about uh, composite molecules. So this is a molecule where you have a, a lipid attached to a polysaccharide. And again, this will have its own properties and will have its own functions in a particular location within the cell. So lipids have several functions within our bodies, but one of the main functions is that they form membranes, starting with the nuclear membrane, the ER, Golgi, and then ending with the plasma membrane. So you have this fantastic endomembrane system, which ends in the plasma membrane. And the plasma membrane and even the other membranes are formed of this lipid bilayer structure, where you have two layers of lipids with the lipid tails interacting with each other and the heads of the lipids, which are charged, facing a watery environment. And so this allows us to uh, demarcate the interior of the cell from the exterior. And so this phospholipid bilayer can be formed as sheets. So you can have a bilayer sheet. You can have uh, spherical structures. So you can have a liposome, uh, which is a lipid bilayer, which is kind of folded up uh, in the form of a sphere. You can have a micelle, which is just a single layer, which is folded up in, uh, into a sphere. So looking at the most famous and well-known form of uh, these structures, you have the phospholipid bilayer in the form of the plasma membrane. And shown here are also different kinds of proteins which can be embedded within this membrane. So the plasma membrane is uh, not just composed of phospholipids, but can also have proteins uh, embedded in it. Going into a little bit more detail on plasma membranes, I thought uh, we will try and update our picture of uh, this plasma membrane. And shown here uh, in figure A is a cross section of a plasma membrane. So you can have a diversity of lipids which will make up the lipid bilayer. So you can have unsaturated lipids and saturated lipids. And the composition of each leaflet, the upper leaflet and the lower leaflet of this uh, lipid bilayer can be different. Apart from that, you can have many proteins which can form part of the membrane. So you can have channel proteins, you can have receptor proteins, uh, you have GPI anchored proteins. So these are proteins which are bound to lipids and so they can freely move. Uh, you can have lipidated proteins. So they have a lipid anchor uh, in them and they extend across uh, the membrane. Then you can have cholesterol, which forms an integral part of the membrane and it changes the fluidity of the membrane. And so depending on the type of cell or the type of environment that the cell uh, is exposed to, the amount of cholesterol will decide the fluidity of the membrane. And if you look at the image in B, you see a 3D version of the same picture shown in A. And the main thing to note here is that you can have different patches of lipids which form part of this lipid bilayer with uh, many different proteins which are embedded in the membrane. One last thing which we should talk about is actin fibers, which are also now considered a part of this cell membrane. And so actually the lipid bilayer and this actin mesh, which is, lies just below the bilayer, forms a composite structure and in total gives uh, the complete properties of the cell membrane. And so the actin meshwork uh, provides some measure of structural integrity and strength to the cell membrane. But depending on the requirement, the meshwork can dissolve or degrade at a particular point and confer more fluidity to the cell membrane at that position. So say, for instance, a cell wants to put out a lamellar podium, then it can dissolve the actin meshwork at that point 
and allow the membrane kind of flow in that particular location. And then this meshwork can reform so that again the integrity of the membrane is maintained. So really we have to think about uh, the cell membrane now as this very intricate and complicated structure consisting of many kinds of lipids, many different kinds of proteins, also many kinds of polysaccharides which can hang out of the lipids along with this actin meshwork just below the lipid bilayer. Here is another view of the lipid bilayer and this is for a vesicle. So vesicles are small structures which are used for uh, transporting chemicals or other molecules uh, from the cell to the membrane of the cell where they could be released. And you can also have traffic uh, going in the opposite direction from the cell membrane into the interiors of the cell. So this is the model of a synaptic vesicle. So these are vesicles which will travel on axons to the synapse and there they will release their cargo which is usually a neurotransmitter into the synaptic space. And uh, this particular study found that vesicles have a very high uh, protein component, uh, over 50% of the vesicle was found to be uh, made up of large number of different kinds of proteins uh, which have been shown here. Again, making the point that we really need to start updating our ideas of membranes from just the simpl simplistic notion of a lipid bilayer. I will end my lecture by talking about uh, an application uh, related to lipids. Post the Second World War, the discovery of cortisone heralded uh, a great advance in the treatment of arthritis. So there are reports of people who couldn't walk because of very crippling arthritis. Upon being given cortisone, they could get up and start walking and you know move their fingers. So there was a lot of interest in the chemical synthesis of cortisone and the starting material uh, that most chemical manufacturers were using at that point was basically a bile, salt, bile salts which you would get animal tissue from uh, slaughterhouses and then isolate the starting point for cortisone from that. And this was a very laborious method and would yield only very small amounts of cortisone. And the number of uh, steps you needed in the synthesis were quite large. Then a company which was based in Mexico uh, hit upon the idea of using plant sterols. So plants also make a variety of sterols for their own purposes. And they started using a plant sterol called diosdenin, which is found in the Mexican yam. And so if you look at the chemical structure of diosdenin, you can see that it also has this four membered ring structure and then it also has these two extra rings. So diosdenin turned out to be an easier starting point for the synthesis of cortisone. And so this company called Syntex made cortisone from a plant-based sterol for the first time. And they could uh, make cortisone in much larger quantities and the chemical synthesis of Cortisone was also a lot easier compared to the starting point which other companies were using. So this allowed Syntex to start making cortisone using diosgen and thus it could reach the market in much larger quantities than before. And then from the chemical synthesis of cortisone, it was but a short step uh, to the chemical synthesis of reproductive hormones. And so they also uh, started to make progesterone, which was then used for making the birth control pill. And this is really the start of a very long journey in terms of the design and uh, synthesis of different kinds of uh, molecules for birth control. And I would urge you to look up some of the work related to this. I've given you one citation here. So with this, we will end our brief tour of biomolecules found in the cell. And uh, we can discuss this more in the tutorial. And I look forward to seeing you then. Thank you.